Chapter 3 Resolve Zuko can't quite forget the ache in his chest, the sinking knowledge that father sent him away to fail, to never return home. But he tries. He buries himself in work, in talking with the various village elders, trying to formulate plans to bring the village back to life, to help its people survive. It seems an impossible task. Though Hideo's advice holds true and the villagers' glares carry a little less venom when his armor is removed, Zuko is still an outsider. He can still feel them staring, and he still doesn't know what to do about it. Maybe even more than when he first arrived, he feels lost. There is so much to be done, and he has precious little to offer. He has to work with what's here, with the few things he owns, and with whatever cunning he can muster. The trouble is that he isn't cunning. He never has been. But like it or not, he is here, and there will be no way out. If Zuko can't find a way to help these people, then he is done. Food. We need food. And medicine. Hideo hangs over Zuko's shoulder, so close that his breath rustles the paper. Rebuild the houses, and... It takes a great deal of restraint to keep from shoving the old man back. Instead, Zuko leans hard to the side and hunches around the few splotches of ink he's managed to put down. I know, he snaps. Don't you think I know that? I've seen the village. Then why aren't you writing it down? Because it's too much. Zuko is only one person, and he can't take everything on at once. If he hopes to succeed here, he needs to know his own limits and move forward one step at a time. He's never been much good at that, either. But he doesn't have a choice. He has to figure out the most important parts and see to it that they come first. If he can't improve things fast enough, the people will suffer for it. Zuko will, too, when they inevitably throw him out for his failure because I don't know what needs to be done first, he answers, his voice harsh and jagged. My, the Fire Lord, only sent me, and you're not helping by giving me a hundred things to do at the same time. He feels the weight of two gazes turn on him, and his ears burn. I'll do all of it, okay? Just start with the important stuff. It's all important. Hideo. The voice from the corner is sharp enough to cut the old man off. You know what he means. Zuko exhales, and his shoulders loosen just a bit as Hideo finally leans away. The village council is only two people, but the woman, Tomoe, seems the more reasonable of the two. At least for now. With a great harumph, Hideo takes another step back. I'd like to know what the Fire Lord means by sending us one underfed kid a month after we first asked for help. Tomoe ignores that and speaks before Zuko's temper has a chance to rise again. Tending to the sick, especially the children, they come first. He nods and his brush hovers an inch over the paper. He agrees, but the trouble is that even that seems insurmountable. Zuko doesn't know the first thing about medicine except for how to treat his own small burns from bending practice, and the little he does know just makes it look harder. There are still too many parts, too many things to do, too many places where everything could go wrong. His jaw tightens. Are there any doctors here? Or medicines, or... Already doing all they can and running short on supplies. Tomoe is curt. We don't need outside help telling us to use what we already have. Right. That's why they wrote to the capital. That's why Father sent Zuko. That's why Father should have sent a whole team and an airship loaded with food and medicine. But he didn't, and Zuko has to live with that. He has to accept that even if he writes to the capital for help, it will never come. He grinds at his eyes with the heels of his hands until reddish spots begin to spin in and out of his vision. 
What's the nearest place we could ask for help? That would be Shu Jing, Tomoe answers. A vague memory of the place hovers in the back of his mind, but he does his best to ignore it. He doesn't have time for that. And how far away is Shu Jing? Three days by foot, two by dragon moose cart. His stomach drops. That's still too long. He remembers the hazy-eyed children staring listlessly out of the windows as he passed. He isn't sure what exactly is wrong with any of them, but he knows that it's dire. Even if a messenger hawk can make the trip in a day and help follows in two, it won't be soon enough for some of them. It has to be done, though. The supplies will save some of them. They haven't responded to any letters, Hideo says. What makes you think they'll help? Tomoe doesn't hesitate. We'll have to send a real messenger this time. And? Are they going to send help out of the goodness of their hearts? Is that it? I'll figure it out, Zuko answers without thinking. He has money. Not very much, but probably still more than the village has. He can afford some supplies. And he can't quite place the memory yet, but he thinks he knows someone from Shu Jing as well. If he isn't mistaken, it could be one of the few places left in the world where his name could matter. How soon can we send someone? Probably tonight. A pause, and then Tomoe continues. It'll be four days at least before they're back. What happens until then? Zuko tries to force back the rising bile in his throat. He doesn't know anything about this. He isn't equipped to handle a village full of sick and starving people, and yet he is the only one who can. Food, water, shelter, medicine, the people need all of it, and he wishes he knew which would help the most. He can only manage one at a time. Water, he decides aloud. His voice sounds uncertain, even to him, and he clears his throat. We'll get the well fixed first, then worry about everything else when there's clean water again. Hideo gives a grudging nod. Zuko lets out a slow breath. It's a rather lackluster sort of approval, but at least it's approval. At least he's earned a day to prove himself before he has to make any further choices. Water will help. He can only hope that that's enough of a start. It feels strange to make herself up as the painted lady out in the open. The sun still shines low in the west, casting blade-like beams between the trees, and Katara can see the bright crimson residue still clinging to her fingertips from the paint she spread in streaks down her arms and across her face. This feels like something to be done in private, but right now, the open wilderness is as private as anywhere else. Appa and Momo will hardly lecture her for dressing up as a spirit and sneaking out of camp, and there is no one else to see her. But while she sits here in the daylight, surrounded by all her other things, the painted lady's robes seem like nothing so much as a silly, childish masquerade. She is a little girl playing at powers beyond her understanding, and it feels like the whole world knows it. But as the sun dips below the horizon and Kotara rises, sweeping on her hat and her veil, it becomes real again. Her shoulders straighten, and she stands a little taller. In the gathering dark, cloaked in anonymity beneath her veil, she becomes powerful. Momo scampers out of her path and hides behind one of Appa's massive legs as she glides past them both and out of the clearing. This is what she remembers about being the Painted Lady. This is the kind of strength she needs to make a difference when she reaches the village. And this time, she will have as many nights as she needs to help them. By the failing light of evening, the journey back to the village seems longer than she remembers. Maybe she shouldn't be surprised by that. The world is awash of deep blues and grays, and shadows crawl across the forest floor, creeping in and out amongst the trees. In the dark, everything is unfamiliar, and the voids of blackness seem to stretch on and on. It's eerie and lonesome amongst the trees, and Katara walks a little faster. She doesn't mind the dark. 
She doesn't mind the forest either, but a forest at night is another matter, especially when she's alone. The last time she was in a darkened forest without her friends, it was with Hama. She tries to forget about that. Hama isn't here, and no one in this part of the Fire Nation means her harm. Any strange noises, any long, creeping shadows are just her mind playing tricks on her. Wind and wildlife both seem more threatening when they're obscured by darkness. As she expects, the unease drops away when she steps beyond the last of the trees and into the open hillside above the village. By the light of the stars and the faintest sliver of the moon, she can see once again, and she has room to wield her water freely. She can feel the humidity on the air and the moisture in the plants around her, all ready to call to her command if she needs it. Out here in the open, she is no longer vulnerable. The village is still when she glides in, every footstep smooth and measured. She summons a faint mist to hover around her limbs and swirl around her feet, then turns down the first street she finds. As far as anyone here will ever know, she is not a girl, but a spirit. Her mists drop away as she slips through the gaping hole in the side of a house to find the family asleep inside. One night won't be enough. She knows that already as she kneels beside a sleeping child and coats her hands in water. One night will cure no one, but she brings the water to the child's forehead anyway. One night doesn't have to cure anyone. Katara has time. For now, all she needs to do is make sure that the people have the same luxury. The child's fever reduces, and Katara works her way through the rest of the house, careful not to make a sound as she checks for wounds and fevers and infections. It's a difficult balance to strike. She needs to do enough to bring them all back from the edge, but she can't spend too much time or strength on any one of them. Somehow, she has to reach them all. Just a nudge toward health. That's all she does for most of them. Cooling a fever, sealing a wound, driving an infection back. For most of them, that will make enough difference. The children earn a little more of her time, but even with them, she limits herself. There will be time for more tomorrow. One by one, she works her way through the broken husks of the houses, keeping to the shadows when she can and shrouding herself in mists when she cannot. Though she begins to grow tired as she zigzags her way to the center of town, she is better at this than she was in Zhang Hui. Her robes glide silent behind her, and no one around her stirs. More than ever before, she feels like the Painted Lady. It isn't until she nears the center of the village that she begins to notice a change. A new sensation hangs in the air, and by the pallid light of the stars, she thinks she can see something new in the middle of the square. She tries to ignore it at first. There are still people to heal, and no amount of curiosity should outweigh that. But she passes through one quiet house where hunger and exhaustion are the only ailments she can find, then another and another. And with each person she is able to leave untouched, her curiosity only grows. At long last, she leaves off in her healing and creeps forward to investigate. It looks like a pile of rubble at first. Like someone gathered up all the bits of broken roofing tiles and heaped them together in the center of town. But Katara knows that isn't the case. She's been stepping over and around the shards of tile all night long, and she can think of nothing else that would look quite like that. Not until she steps closer, at least, and the scent of heavy, moist air strikes her. She circles around it slowly squinting to make out anything more than grayish shadows. The mound of dirt is new, she knows that much for certain. She just doesn't know what it's for until she sees the uneven ring of stones encircling a great, deep hole. Katara can't quite understand why, but she finds herself smiling as she edges nearer, holding her hat in place to peer down into the blackness. She can see nothing, but down, way, way down, she can feel something. With her free hand, she makes a scooping motion, and water surges up from the depths to meet her. Her smile broadens. As wells go, this one is neither deep nor elegant, 
but the fact that it's here, freshly dug and ready to bring clean water to the village, feels hopeful. Like despite everything that's gone wrong, despite the odds stacked up against the village, someone still stood up and decided that it was worthwhile to fight. Like there is someone else in the village who believes enough in their chances of survival to work to the point of exhaustion for a single, small improvement. They will survive. Katara will make sure of that. If nothing else, she'll do it for the person who dug the well. She can only hope that they recognize her appreciation somehow. For hours longer, Katara continues searching, moving in silence between every house, every half-collapsing pile of rubble in search of people to heal. Every house, that is, except for one. At the northwestern edge of the village, a small house sits mostly intact, all its walls upright, with a roof still in place. There is nothing terribly unusual about it, nothing that should look out of place. But the door hangs crooked on its hinges, and a faint orange light flickers out around its edges. Katara hangs back. The light doesn't necessarily mean anything. It could simply be a candle left to burn through the rest of its wick, or a lamp turned down low while its owner sleeps. This house could be like all the others, still and quiet despite the glow emanating from within. But it's the first light she's seen in the entire village. She edges a little closer, thickening the mists at her back as she watches the light shift through the open doorway in soft flashes of orange and red. There's someone inside, she is certain of that. A parent tending to a sick child, perhaps, or someone lonely and frightened, trying desperately to tend their own wounds by candlelight. Someone who needs her help. Someone who may not last the night without her. There has to be something that sets this house apart from all the rest. Some reason why the light burns here, but nowhere else. Some greater need for Katara to investigate. Or it might be the opposite. The light could be a sign that everything is fine here, that the person inside is well enough to tend to flame to work through the night. It could mean that this place is a threat to her. She doesn't quite believe that, and yet she can't bring herself to venture any closer. Instead, she circles the house, squinting into the glow as she searches for any openings, any cracks small enough to peer through without revealing herself. She finds none and when she returns to her place in the street, she bites her lip. Whether she is needed here or not, the light might give her away. If she gives herself away, she might be caught. And if she's caught, she won't be able to help any of them. As much as she longs to help, she can't throw aside the rest of the village for this one house. She has to be pragmatic. If she risks her safety to find out who's inside, she may not be able to help anyone at all. Still, she stays where she is, watching the faint, flickering glow until it finally goes out. Tomorrow, she promises herself. Tomorrow, she'll find out who is inside.